everybody. Welcome back to Crime Weekly. I am Stephanie Harlow. And I'm Derek Lavasser. So today we are going into our fifth and final part of the Michelle Lawless series. And today we're actually going to fast forward into the future. We're going to leave 1994 and we're going to travel to January of 2006. But before we dive in, is there anything you want to throw out there or do you just want to get going? Nope. We're recording on a Sunday right now because this is going to be the episode you guys are seeing in the upcoming week. And we're going to be recording our regular night tomorrow because we won't be able to record the week of CrimeCon, which we're super excited about. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's Sunday. Let's get right Let's get right into it. <laughs> All right. So we're in January 2006. At this time, Bill Farrell had ended his almost 30-year reign as the sheriff of Scott County, and a man named Rick Walter had taken his place. Now, if that name sounds familiar to you, it's because we've already talked about Rick Walter during this series during part one and briefly during part two, but he hasn't really come back into the story since. Walter was one of the first two responders on the scene of Michelle Lawless's murder. Remember, it was him and uh, Deputy Moore. And he also interviewed Mark Abbott the afternoon after Michelle's murder at Mark Abbott's trailer. Now, Walter had never been comfortable with Josh Keezer's conviction. He said, quote, There were serious unanswered questions. How did Josh get from Kankakee to Benton to be able to use Amanda Drury's car? Why would he have wanted to kill Michelle in the first place? Being rejected by a girl at a party seemed an unlikely motive to travel 350 miles to hunt her down and kill her a week later. I thought that at least others had to be involved. End quote. So when Walter was sheriff, he decided to quietly reopen the case, only telling those in his department that they were going to be taking another look at it. But later he realized that someone must have leaked that information because just a few days after announcing this to the people in his department, Sheriff Walter received a visit from Kevin Williams. Walter claims that at this point in 2006, he hadn't even developed a list of suspects yet, and he had no clue that Kevin Williams was even connected in any way. But Kevin Kevin started making those connections for Walter. Sheriff Walter said that Kevin came into his office and informed him that he'd been told the lawless investigation had been reopened and that he was a suspect in Michelle's murder. Kevin said he could not have been involved because he had an alibi, his wife Terry Williams, and she would confirm that they'd both been at a party at Kevin's boss's house in commerce that night, and then they'd gone home and they went to bed. Now, Terry Williams would in fact support her husband's alibi, even testifying to the fact that they were together together that night in 2008. But in 2009, Terry and Kevin Williams got divorced and Terry withdrew his alibi. She told the Southeast Missourian that she remembered Kevin had left the party that night. He had left with Mark Abbott. Mark Abbott wanted to go out. Mark Abbott wanted to go um, to the Honky Tonk Bar where he was going to meet up with with, uh, one of his girlfriends. And he wanted Kevin to come with him. And Mark had always said that Kevin came with him, but Kevin said he didn't. Kevin said that his wife, Terry, was mad that he wanted to go, so he ended up staying at the party. But as Terry would finally remember after they had gotten divorced, that didn't happen. He left that night, and she had gotten a ride home from his mother. Terry also said that the morning after Michelle's murder, Mark Abbott showed up at the home she shared with Kevin in Commerce, and he basically took Kevin, and they told her they were going to the Feral Mobile Homes sales lot to look for evidence and clues, I guess, in relation to Michelle's murder. This is interesting, and this is how this happens, right? First off, my big question, and we may never know, is how did Kevin find out about this? Obviously, there's oh, leaks. Oh, we know. I'm going to tell you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that's the question I'm having right now, where clearly uh, there's some there's some moles in, internally, and they went right to Kevin Williams. And what's interesting is, at, as you said, no suspects had even been developed yet, but Kevin not only put himself on that list and already had his alibi lined up. So clearly at this point, he, he was looking at it, well, you know, I got by with it the first time, some other guy had been charged with this. And so I'm just not going to say anything. But now that it's being reopened, he's looking at it saying, oh, you know what? Maybe I better get ahead of this. As far as the alibi itself, it's one of those things where as an investigator, you don't normally put too much weight or too much stock in what a significant other says as far Mm -hmm. as an alibi. You You would prefer to have someone who's impartial and unbiased say, yeah, no, I saw I saw Kevin at the party and I don't I'm not I'm not sleeping with him. I'm not married to him. I have no relation to him. I'm just telling you what I saw. Um, Yeah, they'll sometimes still be friends or acquaintances. So you always got to measure that against what they're saying. But when you have a wife, of course, she's going to give her husband an alibi like that's expected. 
But what you always hope for is that if there's trouble in paradise, you get a situation like this where finally that person will come forward and tell you what really went down. And as far as what she's saying, extremely incriminating, right? You have these two individuals, apparently from what Mark has told us all along, he was just a guy who rolled up on the car, found Michelle unresponsive, and that was really his involvement. So why would he be meeting up with Kevin Williams the next morning to go look, look for, for a quote? <laughs> To go look for evidence. Like, what <laughs> what bearing does that have on you? Uh, so doesn't make a lot of sense, and it doesn't sound good for Mark or for Kevin at this point. Well, apparently when Walter reopened the investigation, he got a lot of pushback from uh, local law enforcement. You know, like there was a lot of people even in his department that weren't a fan. Bill Farrell was out there talking shit, you know, about it. Yep. And um Walter said he even asked the state highway patrol for help and they were basically like, no, we're not going near this. So it kind of shows you the attitude towards this case in the area. Like it was done. It was somebody was in prison for it. Why are we opening this door? Why are we burying things that have long been buried? Why are we unburying things that have long been buried? There's there's two elements to this, right? There's the, the first element, which is why are we wasting time on a case that's already solved? There's other cases that we have to work on. But the bigger component, and it, this always goes back to the human element of law enforcement, when you reopen a case or when you just go in to look at a case that hasn't been solved, indirectly there are egos that get involved and it's not only you looking for the truth, but it's also you questioning their work and their intelligence and their mm -hmm. performance. And that may not even be your intentions. You just want the truth. But I, I've personally experienced this with the shows that I've done for, for Discovery where these cases are unsolved. I want to go in there and look at the work that was previously done. And these guys who don't even know me won't give me the time of day because they're like, well, what are you going to do that we, we hadn't already done? And so by him reopening this, that's him indirectly saying, like, I think you guys may have gotten it wrong. And so I feel like that's a big element to this case and, and other cases as well where it's not the uh, the quote unquote right thing to do to come in there and question your colleague's work. So there again, that always plays into it. Not saying it's right, but just I think a lot of you guys can probably relate to that because in any profession that you have, if you come in after the fact and start questioning someone who worked there before you or who works there while you're there, there's going to be some some bad blood. There's going to be some hard feelings. So that's what's kind of going on here, in my opinion. I mean, Rick Walter would have been on the case if he hadn't been pushed out, you know. <laughs> and, and listen, let's add that wrinkle. Could that have been part of the reason that he wanted to reopen it? Like, oh, you guys thought you were going to push me out then? Well, guess what? Now I'm the top dog. I'm reopening it anyways. That could also. Now, again, at the core, he could be just wanting the truth. Mm -hmm. But we have to acknowledge the human element of all this, right? Like there's egos, there's feelings, there's all these things going on. And unfortunately, sometimes the cases are used as bartering chips and they are used as ways of getting back at people or ways of getting a message across should never happen. But we're going to be honest with, I'm going to be honest with you guys from the inside, you know, what I've seen, it happens. It's wrong. It never should. But that doesn't mean it doesn't occur. Well, I think it's the right thing to reopen this case when he, he was one of the first people on scene. He had suspicions of Mark Abbott from the get go and right. Mark was never treated as a suspect. And then some random kid gets like thrown in prison for this crime and Walter's yep. like, well, this what what I saw as the first responder on this scene does not match with what they're saying happened and who committed it. So right. I I have to wait until I have some power and some pull to be able to revisit this, but I will revisit it. Like he yeah, maybe always he didn't forget. knew that. Yeah. He didn't forget. And it's unfortunate for Josh that it took this for that to occur. I know 2006 it gets not reopened. Good. He's not he's not out of prison until 2009. Not good, but better late than never, I guess. I don't know. That's a shitty way of looking at it. I know. Right? It's like I like to say better late than never. And I guess, yes, better late than yeah, never. Yeah, Josh but, would disagree. Right. <laughs> you know, and I and I would agree with I him. I mean, he'd still agree better late than never, but also but, maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe. Maybe never at all. Never at all. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think he'd prefer that option. Well, according to Sheriff Rick Walter, he soon figured out from Kevin that it was Bill Farrell who had informed Kevin Williams about Michelle's case being reopened. Now, Walter has claimed that um, reopening the case caused some tension between himself and multiple people within law enforcement. 
and he met opposition at, he says, the local, state, and federal levels. Now, Bill Farrell has denied knowing Kevin Williams on any personal level, but Williams claims that he was demolishing a building with his excavation company one day when Bill Farrell approached the work site and basically informed him that the Michelle Lawless case had been reopened, and he told him, Kevin Williams, that he was the number one suspect. Bill Farrell said to Kevin Williams, you are the number one suspect. Now, according to Kevin Williams, he and Farrell talked about the case and about Sheriff Walter often, almost every single day. And he told Rick Walter, quote, I'm sure you know exactly what we say because I am sure that you have our phones tapped and are recording our conversations about this, end quote. Now, Rick Walter is like, I don't know what this dude's talking about. We didn't have his phones tapped. I didn't even know he existed. Like He was not on my radar at all. But what I think is happening here, if I would speculate because obviously I don't know what the truth is, but if I'm going to speculate and I'm going to say that what Kevin Williams claims is true, that that the ex-sheriff, Bill Farrell, informed him about this case being reopened and told him he was a suspect, and also that both of these men seem to think their phones were tapped, this is maybe a little bit of a guilty conscience. So I know I did something wrong, and I know that the police are probably smarter than me. And so I'm going to feel paranoid that they're already on to me. They've been on to me for a while. I don't know what I left behind. I'm not like good at covering my tracks. Maybe they have something on me. Maybe the X is going to fall any day. And so I'm just going to volunteer this information instead of having them tell me that they found it on their own because I'm sure they're listening to me in some way, right? Now, Rick, the sheriff, ex-sheriff Bill Farrell wouldn't have known whether Kevin Williams' phones were tapped, but he could have said something like, well, you know, if we had a suspect during my time being sheriff, that's what we would have done. And so now both of these men are paranoid that they're like the target of an investigation when they weren't, and these actions caused them to be. Yeah, I would even take it a step further and say, it's possible that Bill gets wind of what's going on internally, maybe has a conversation with Mark as well, knows that Kevin wasn't directly involved with whatever happened. So he goes to him, maybe embellishes how much of a suspect Kevin Williams is, hoping that Kevin's going to flip off the handle and go into the police like department <laughs> like he did and, and try to find out what they know uh, on behalf of Bill. And Mark, right? Like he, they didn't want to go in there themselves. That would look too obvious. So they get Kevin all riled up. They tell him, hey, man, they probably got your phones tapped. You're definitely the number one suspect. Kevin Williams was never the number one suspect, especially at this point. But Kevin's hearing this from Bill, who's a former you know, law enforcement officer. He's taking him at his word. So he immediately runs in there, goes and talks to him. And now, obviously, Kevin's going back to Bill. And maybe Bill's going back to Mark. Who knows? Allegedly, maybe. And filling them in. On, their, on his conversations with the active investigators. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's what happened, right? But of course, Bill Farrell says no. Of course not. Yeah. We've, we've done this tactic before, too, in narcotics, where the low-hanging fruit, the guy who's at the bottom of the totem pole, will go to him and say, listen, man, they're rolling on you left and right. I, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't talk to those guys. I don't know what they're doing. And it's like, yeah, man, they're... T- they, they're, they're, they're rolling on you and they're, they're, we think that you know where the main house is and all these different things, where they're holding the money, where they're holding the drugs. So we'll send him off all paranoid and we'll follow and surveil them for a few days. And sure enough, because they're paranoid, if we have their phones already tapped, we'll, they'll start making phone calls. They'll start making mistakes. And they may even go to the locations that we're trying to identify in the process. So they're basically doing the work for us just because of the paranoia we were able to create. Yeah. Well, but Bill Farrell wasn't like actively involved in law enforcement at this time. So No, but he knows the tactics. Yeah. He knows the tactics and he knows that if he goes directly in there and starts saying, well, why are you reopening this case? It makes him look guilty. Mm-hmm. So he wants to rile up Kevin Williams to do his dirty work for him. And he's not filling Kevin. In. Kevin's a pawn. Mm. Kevin's a pawn in this where Bill's going to him saying, hey, you know, just a heads up. Heard they reopened the case. And by the way, Wink, wink, nod, nod. You're the main suspect. I, that would get anybody scared, especially if if Bill knows Kevin didn't do it, but Kevin knows who did. Now Kevin's going to want to separate himself because I didn't I didn't kill this woman. I didn't do this. Why could I, I'm not going to prison for this? So he immediately runs into the station and starts singing like a canary, probably more than Bill expected him to. Yeah, I mean, I think that. Uh... Kevin Williams was probably involved more than than we think, but or more than 
I don't know if Bill Farrell would know that. I'm not sure. Like, once again, this is so, so many of these conversations happened underneath the cover of secrecy that you just don't know who Farrell spoke to, what was said. But I think that there's there's plenty of evidence to show that both Mark and Kevin were there on the evening of Michelle Lawless's murder, at least circumstantial evidence. All right, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. What do you call a person who speaks three languages? Trilingual. Someone who speaks two? Bilingual. Someone who speaks one? American. Only 22% of Americans speak a language either than English at home. Start learning a new language this fall and be the exception, not the rule. Because with Babbel, you start speaking a new language in just three weeks. Why Babbel? Because it works. Instead of paying hundreds of dollars for a private tutor or fooling yourself with language apps that are little more than games, Babbel's quick 10-minute lessons are designed by over 150 language experts to help you start speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. Babbel is designed by real people for real conversations. All of Babbel's tips and tools for learning a new language are approachable, accessible, rooted in real-life situations, and delivered with conversation-based teaching. Babbel's courses have been so convenient for me. It's much easier to work with Babbel than to work with any other language learning apps I've ever used. You can pick it up. You can do a lesson in 10 minutes. You can be reminded to do your lesson every single day. And they have way more than lessons. They have podcasts, games. There's a million different ways that you can learn how to speak a new language with Babbel. Studies from Yale, Michigan State University and others continue to prove Babbel is better. For instance, one study found that using Babbel for 15 hours is equivalent to a full semester at college and with over 10 million subscriptions sold Babbel is real language learning for real conversations that's right we love Babbel they've been a longtime supporter of the channel so if you want to support us make sure you support them so here's a special limited time deal for our listeners and viewers to get started right now get 55% off your Babbel subscription but only for our listeners and viewers at babbel.com slash crime weekly once again Get 55% off at babbel.com slash crime weekly, and that's spelled B A B B E L dot com slash crime weekly. Rules and restrictions may apply. Okay, we're back. So according to Bill Farrell, like I said, Kevin Williams was lying. He said he didn't know Kevin Williams that well, and since his father also had an excavation business. He would sometimes see Kevin Williams on sites, but, quote, I haven't talked to Kevin in a long, long time, end quote. Now, before I continue on with this line of um, investigation, we need to talk about the SEMO Drug Task Force and Operation Speed Bump. So as the Scott County Sheriff's Office was investigating the murder of Michelle Lawless in the summer of 1993, there was a meth ring actively happening in Benton, Missouri and its surrounding areas. In the 1980s and 90s, meth was being brought in by a motorcycle gang known as the Pharaohs. But when they were taken out of the picture by law enforcement, allegedly a woman named Dixie Counts, located right outside of Scott City, took over. And she reportedly began using truckers to transport large quantities of meth into the area. It seems that Counts is where Kevin Williams first started to get his product. But eventually he figured out that he could make a bigger profit if he cut out the middleman, a.k.a. Dixie Counts, and started getting his own supply out of California. Kevin would eventually recruit both Mark and Matt Abbott to help him, and he would even later testify that their father, Larry Abbott, was involved and had once fronted a large amount of money for a big buy. According to the Southeast Missourian, quote, in the mid-1990s, Kevin Williams, Mark Abbott, and Matt Abbott were known methamphetamine distributors in Southeast Missouri and were convicted of federal drug crimes during that decade. Sheriff Walter said he knew that Williams, at one point, was working for the SEMO Drug Task Force as an informant, end quote. Now, Terry Williams has also stated that her husband was definitely an informant and task force agents had come to their house so that they could be present when Kevin made calls to his connections in California. Now, Sheriff Bill Farrell had spearheaded the creation of the SEMO Drug Task Force, and he was very hands-on with it during his time as sheriff and during the time of Michelle's murder. Yet he claimed that at the time of the murder, he had no idea there was even any connection between Mark Abbott and Kevin Williams. Now, Williams would go on to serve five years for his role in the meth ring, even though he was pretty much at a higher position than Mark or Matt Abbott in the drug ring. He would only serve five years. But in August of 1997, Mark Abbott was sentenced to 20 years in prison for conspiracy to distribute meth. 
And also his brother, Matt, would go to prison for this. And you can see the differences in sentence between five years and 20 years and probably conclude that, yes, Kevin Williams was an informant, which is why, as the kingpin, basically, he only got five years. Yeah, I can confirm. Uh, as, as someone who is heavily involved in narcotics, this is what we did. Sometimes to get all the people involved, because you don't just want to get the head of the snake, right? Because if you do, then one Somebody of their- Somebody else becomes sub- the head of the snake. <laughs> one of their subordinates are going to take over the operation. So yeah. when you go in there, yes, you want to get the top guy, but you want to try to get the whole administration, if you will, anybody who could take over and, and fulfill that role because they know all the inner workings. So yes, in some situations, if it's the top guy that you're able to get, which- to be honest with you, usually isn't the case. It's usually the opposite. Mm-hmm. But if it is right, the case- Right, that's what I was thinking. It's usually one of the underlings. It's the it's the underlings, but for whatever reason, they must have pinched him with something. Mm-hmm. And so they oh, get they him. And he- oh, yeah, they did. He was at a hotel. I know this story. He was at a hotel with one of his girlfriends, even though he's married. And one of the other guests at the hotel called the police and they were like, yo, there's some sketchy shit happening in these two rooms. So the police show up and they see this green truck pulling out of the parking lot and they pull the truck over. And inside is Kevin Williams and his girlfriend. And there's like a gun in the car. There's there's drugs in the car. So they got him for that. And then, yeah, he he must have while he was getting arrested for that, become an informant for Operation Speed Bump. That makes sense. And have you ever seen the movie American Gangster? Oh, yeah. One of my favorites. Okay. Denzel. So, so, so that movie obviously has the it's based on the true story. Frank yeah. Lucas was the with yeah. that, and Frank Lucas was the main guy. He was pushing tons of narcotics, but he wasn't necessarily doing the hand to hand. But when they got him, obviously they got a lot of people, but they got him, and then he got a reduced sentence by working with the agents. Right? He mm-hmm. was the main guy, but they were able to get everybody else because he rolled on everyone and Damn. in order to you know, take down his operation completely. So. Not saying this guy was not saying Kevin Williams was Frank Lucas, but no, you know what I mean. He could it's never the, be. It's the same. It's the same. <laughs> you know, situation. Yeah, yeah. Because you usually see it the other way around. I agree. It's usually somebody else who's getting pinched, and they're like, "Let me give you yeah, the we organization." Want that guy. Yeah, but it happened to be Kevin Williams in this case. And I mean, we also have to understand, like, as much as you're playing, like you're a big boy. You're really not a big boy until you're arrested and facing like consequences for what you've done. So like these stupid like 20 year old, you know, kids in freaking Benton, Missouri, thinking that they're like drug kingpins, acting like they're drug kingpins, bragging about it. They become less hard when they're sitting in an interrogation room. They're no longer drug kingpins. They're just 20 something idiots who didn't really know what they were doing and weren't careful. True. So that same year, 1997, the same year that he was sentenced to 20 years in prison for conspiracy to distribute meth, Mark Abbott told a member of the task force, Officer Bill Bonart, that Kevin Williams had been with him on the night of the murder and that it was Williams who had shot Michelle Lawless. Abbott claimed that Kevin and Michelle had been having an affair and she told him she was pregnant with his child. Mark said that Kevin wanted to talk to Michelle that night to try and calm her down. So the two men followed Michelle in her car and Abbott flat his lights at her from behind. Mark Abbott said that after Michelle pulled over, she and Kevin briefly argued, and then Mark heard gunshots, and then Kevin took off on foot, heading in the direction of Feral Mobile Home Sales. Abbott then reported what had happened to the police, and later he swung back around to pick Kevin up. So a lot of the story doesn't make sense, and we don't know exactly what Mark Abbott told Bill Bonnart, like how did Michelle get into her car? Why was there blood going down that slope? But what is interesting to me is it would make sense now why Mark Abbott was back at the scene of the crime after allegedly reporting what he'd seen to the sheriff's office. It would not make sense if he came back just because he was curious, because now you're placing yourself there for no reason. But if you had to come back to pick up your friend who ran away and now you want to swing back around and pick him up, you're going to have to go back past that same like area. And there you are. That makes more sense than him just going back because he was curious. What else makes sense is some of the crime scene evidence that we do have, right? We know that for some reason, Michelle got out of her vehicle. We've been talking about it for four episodes, right? This is our fifth one. And we're going across all these different things. And we're talking about, you know, could it have been this situation where it was an assassination? Could it have been the situation where she went out to, you know, vomit or go to the bathroom, whatever, like what would make her get out of her car in the middle of the night? And we've been very on the opposite sides of why that would be, but we know for certain that she got out and we know that there was some type of assault 
that happened before she was back in her vehicle. We know that from the blood. We know that she had been struck. I believe there was some pooling there as well, which would suggest she was in that position for an extended period of time for a couple minutes, maybe. Mm -hmm. So you have that low velocity blood spatter that's going onto the ground, showing that she was in that position, either standing or, or leaning over. So how does she get outside the car? Well, if you kind of take the evidence that we know to be true and apply this scenario, it could line up where, as you said, Mark flashes his lights. She decides to pull over, even though she's only a mile from home, but she recognizes the car or recognizes the people inside. So she would do that voluntarily. Well, if if Kevin's in the car, he's going to obviously get out. Maybe she gets out as well. And initially the conversation is not a good conversation, obviously, but not maybe intended to go this way. But for whatever reason, and we know, we know that Michelle has had a history of making these types of claims as yes. far as being pregnant. So yes. we're not we're not victim bashing here. We know that to be true. Mm -hmm. And so is it possible she could have said it here? Of course. So they're having a conversation. It elevates. There's an assault that happens. That's your initial blood spatter. That's your initial blood pattern. Kevin's realizing what's going on and realizing that this isn't going to go away and it's only going to get worse. And either he puts her back in the car or she's trying to flee the area and gets back in on her own. And that's when Kevin shoots her. Now, I know where you're going with this as far as because I'm trying to remember everything we've talked about. But I, I believe you had said there was a witness who saw someone walking on that interstate right around that time. They described him as walking around. And I know we had said maybe that was Mark Abbott. Mm -hmm. But in reality, that could have been Kevin Williams. Yeah. And Mark was Waiting the one for coming Mark back. To pick him up. Yeah. So we, we talked about it where you're like, oh, could that have been Mark Abbott? Well, maybe it was Kevin Williams. He's walking away from the crime scene. And that's who the other witnesses had seen walking down that road shortly after. Mm -hmm. And how does it all play together with Mark? Mark knows what happened. He was present for it. Maybe he wasn't the, the actual offender, but he would know where the blood and where the, where the initial argument started. And maybe that's why initially he said, oh, I saw, uh, you know, this hitchhiker over in this area that jumped the guardrail knowing that that's not what happened, but something did occur in that area. Yes. So by him saying that, it would give some credibility to his story. Yes. That's my thoughts. A lot. It's a lot there. We're going out with a lot of speculative stuff there. But when you start to take factual evidence and compare it to stories that are being presented by potential witnesses, you can match it up with the actual evidence that will not change over time. But here's the thing. I don't think that Kevin Williams and Michelle Lawless were sleeping together. And by this time, it's, what, 2007? The trials already happened. Michelle's diary entries have already been made, you know, public basically during the trial. So Mark Abbott would know that she had a history of making those claims. And yeah. he would know that it made sense that that would be a motive, right? Right. So Can I throw one more thing at you? Yeah. Although I laid out that scenario because I don't want to go too far ahead. What I, what I would say just for our audience is even though I just laid out a plausible scenario with the players being involved, let me just throw this at you. It sounds pretty accurate, right? What had happened? Well, maybe it's accurate because that is what happened, but maybe the roles were reversed. Exactly. <laughs> that's all. Again, I don't want to steal the thunder here. but No, I agree. I, and I mean, that's, that's kind of where I'm going with it. Like, right. you're now the one who's talking. So you're laying out the narrative and you can easily tell us the, you know, because the, it's exactly the timeline what happened. of that night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but the but, roles were different. Yeah. There was no um, evidence or any people who are coming forward saying that Michelle Lawless was interested in Kevin Williams or that right. she thought he was cute. But there were people who said she talked about the Abbots. She mm. thought they were attractive. She thought there was a set of twins that were attractive. So there's no, no Kevin in her journal entries either. No Kevin in her journal entries. Just putting that out there. Yeah. So that's, you know, once again, do I think it's possible Kevin Williams was there? I think it's probable. But... And he may have even been the one to pull the trigger. Like, we don't know. But at the end of the day, it was not he who was the connection to Michelle. It was yeah. not he that was the reason they were there following Michelle that night. That's what I think. And and, and by, that's not us just like throwing it out, of, you know, pulling it out of our you know what. We're going off our victim's journal entries. Yeah. If there was this this relationship with with Kevin, you would think there would be some mention of it, just like she's mentioned every other relationship. Mm -hmm. There's not. But coincidentally, the guy relaying what happened that night pretty accurately based on the crime scene evidence, uh, his name is the same name that's in the book shortly before her death. Yeah. Yeah. It, not much of a leap there. But again, I didn't want to steal too much thunder, but I would say to have that level of guilt knowledge, potentially guilt knowledge, you're, you're either telling the exact truth 
or you're flopping, you're flipping over roles in order to not implicate yourself. Yeah. Well, Bill Bonnard, the officer that Mark confessed this to, he informed the Cape Girardeau County prosecutor, Morley Swingle, who told him to bring the information to Don Wyndham, who remembers the lead detective with the Missouri State Highway Patrol. Bill Farrell would later claim that Wyndham had not passed this information on. But Wyndham was like, oh, no, that's not true, my friend. I did. He said he did tell Farrell about Bonart's information. And Farrell would have heard this twice, once from Wyndham and once from Bonart himself. But as it turns out, Mark Abbott would not be the only eyewitness to place Kevin Williams at the scene. On the night of Michelle Lawless's murder, a man named Dallas Butler was riding his motorcycle towards his mother's house in Mississippi County. He'd been crossing over on Highway 77 when he saw a car pulled over on the northbound ramp near the overpass. As the car was illuminated by his headlights, Butler claims he saw a woman slumped over the steering wheel and a man wearing a red hat standing outside the vehicle and reaching into the car. Butler claims that as he approached, the man turned to him and said, you know, move on, everything's fine here, she's fine. But Butler said the woman was not moving at all and appeared to be unconscious, and he was uncomfortable with the whole situation. After he saw the news about Michelle's murder at that location, Butler went to the Justice Center in Benton and told a woman there what he had seen, but he never heard anything about it again until 2009. In 2015, Dallas Butler picked Kevin Williams' photo out of a lineup, identifying him as the man that he'd seen outside of Michelle's car that night, and this was two months after Terry Williams would leave her husband with no alibi for the night of the murder. I have a couple questions just to clarify, because I'm trying to get a visual of, of what we're, what you're describing here. Obviously, big, really mm-hmm. big. Yeah. When you're seeing this motorcycle driver is going over the overpass on 77, No, right? he was going, um, he saw, because the exit's right by the overpass. Right, the so I'm trying to exit, visually yeah. picture this. There's the exit right by this, this overpass, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, is does he see the vehicle that Kevin Williams is in on the overpass or on the on ramp itself? Like, he didn't or before, see. He saw Michelle's vehicle. Michelle's vehicle, and he yeah. saw a guy with a red hat at the vehicle leaning in, and from that he was already off the or, 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 on ramp, right? Or I the would off ramp. assume so. Yeah. You get what I'm trying to say. Yeah. I'm trying to figure out how he would have he this. He came like, close right enough. up on the car, so, so I mean, maybe no. he pulled. Maybe he went down there. Maybe yeah. he went down there I or whatever to check there. on him, which yeah. is possible. Hey, yeah. whoa, late at night. Let me go check. And this guy said, "Can you continue moving?" Yeah. Um, and I'm and I think you would have mentioned this, but this this cyclist only saw one person. He only saw Kevin Williams. Correct. He only saw one person. That's what he said. Yeah. Right. And at this point, we know based on the condition of Michelle, based on how he described it, not knowing what had happened, Mm -hmm. she's already she's already been shot at this point. She's already been shot or she's unconscious from the blow to the head. That's consistent with the butt of a gun, which is she's inside the car. Yeah. But that's what the police think happened, that she was outside of her car. An argument ensued. She was chased, hit on the head with the with the butt of the gun, put back into her car. And when she regained consciousness, that's when she was shot. Okay, And refresher, she was shot all three times, three times, all in the back of the head. Basically, yeah. Because, I mean, you could make the argument that she was struck knocked unconscious, put inside the vehicle, never regained consciousness, and was was assassinated, was killed. Based on the way the bullets hit her and then landed in her car, they believe that she was turning. um, Okay. So I don't have the ballistics. The trajectory rods would suggest that she had been in movement. Yes. Okay. I'm with you there. It's hard. It's hard when I'm not looking at the reports or looking at the images. And it's hard when this investigation wasn't done properly, honestly. There you go. So, but that would, that would make a difference. And then obviously you have stippling. So you, sometimes you also have, you know, your natural reaction is to put your hand up. You might have some type of gun stippling on your hand, gunpowder residue on your hands because you're trying to, your natural reaction, even though you can't stop a bullet is to put, block it. Mm -hmm. So those are the things I'm thinking about. But if she was just regaining consciousness or maybe she was never fully out, but pretty much, you know, not completely coherent. Mm-hmm. And as she's starting to regain consciousness, that that's when it happens. So anyways, let's let's take a quick break. We'll be right back. Okay. 
This episode is brought to you by IQ Bar. I love uh, IQ Bar. I love their protein bars. Their IQ Bar sampler pack is amazing because you get to try all of the flavors. I love using IQ Bar protein bars for a quick brain boost midday around 3 o'clock when I start to uh, kind of lose my focus. I love that um, if I really don't have time to eat at night before I go to the gym, I can have the protein bar really quick and I know I'm not going in completely dry. So whether you want the perfect healthy grab-and-go breakfast, mood-boosting hydration before or after a workout, or jitter-free caffeine to get you out of that afternoon slump, IQ Bar has it all. All IQ Bar products are gluten-free, dairy-free, soy-free, and contain no GMOs or artificial sweeteners. And IQ Bars are plant-based protein bars packed with high-quality ingredients for both your brain and body. And every single flavor, whether it's chocolate, sea salt, peanut butter chip, wild blueberry, and more, tastes absolutely amazing. And IQ Bar also has IQ Mix which is a zero sugar drink mix that hydrates with electrolytes, improves mood with magnesium, which is super important, and boosts clarity with Lion Mane's adaptogen. On top of all the other benefits, I really love how good these flavors are. Blood orange is my favorite. Peach mango is probably my second favorite. IQ Bar makes the number one brain and body nutrition bar, hydration mix, and instant coffee in the U.S. with over 10,000 five-star reviews. We love IQ Bar. We think you will too. Derek's going to tell you how you can check it out for yourself. That's right. Refuel smarter with IQ Bar's ultimate sampler pack. That's seven IQ bars, four IQ mix sticks, and four IQ Joe sticks. And now our special podcast listeners and viewers get 20% off all IQ Bar products, plus free shipping. To get your 20% off, just text WEEKLY to 64000. Go get your discount. That's WEEKLY to 64000. One more time, WEEKLY to 64000. And here for the fine print, by texting 64000, you agree to receive reoccurring automated marketing messages from IQ Bar. Message and data rates may apply. No purchase required. Terms apply. Available at IQBar.com. Reply stop to stop. Help to help. All right, so this brings us back to 1994 for a minute, when Don Wyndham testified that Bill Farrell had hit Josh Keezer with charges against Wyndham's advice. Wyndham said the charges were, quote, a surprise to me because I didn't, at that point, feel like I had finished the investigation enough to know what the truth of the charges were. The sheriff got the warrants on his own without telling me that he had the warrants charging him with first-degree murder, end quote. Now, there's plenty of information out there tying Kevin Williams and the Abbots to this drug ring, and we're going to talk about some of it as it applies to the case. But if you want all the information, you should go and listen to Episode 8 of the Lawless Files podcast, which is done by Bob Miller, and it gets really deep in there. But basically, what I want you to take away from this is that there's a preponderance of information showing that Bill Farrell— was very familiar with Kevin Williams and that he most likely had been the one to give Williams the heads up that Sheriff Walter had reopened the Michelle Lawless case, a fact that Farrell was openly agitated by the reopening of the case. Since he had referred to the conviction of Josh Keezer as one of his proudest accomplishments in his almost 30 years of law enforcement experience. When he retired in 2004, Farrell told the Southeast Missourian, quote, We got a conviction almost entirely on circumstantial evidence. I'm really proud of the effort that went into that case and brought it to a conclusion. End quote. <laughs> He's like, we got this case pushed through with no evidence, no physical evidence. And I'm super proud of it. Now, this once again contradicts with what Farrell said when he was deposed in 1994, at which time he testified that he believed more than one person was responsible for the murder, telling Josh's defense attorney, quote, I wouldn't want to speculate other than what the facts show as we found at the scene, end quote. So he's literally saying like, oh, the the facts at the scene show that there's more than one person involved. But then when he retires in 2004, he's like, we got our guy and I'm super proud of it. And case closed. Years later, Kevin Williams would leave an angry message on the answering machine of his ex-wife, Terry, where he claimed that he would shoot Rick Walter right between the eyes as he walked out of his front door. Terry's mother gave Walter this message. And in March of 2010, when Williams was arrested after beating his 17-year-old son, Walter played the message for Kevin. And he was like, oh, this is what you said. And at first, Kevin claimed like, oh, no, I didn't mean it. I was just angry. But Walter sort of baited him. And he was like, come on, Kevin, you know, if you had the chance to kill me, you would. And this prompted Kevin to angrily say, you're goddamn right, because he's easily baited, apparently, and not too smart. Why would you say that? 
But anyways, Walter also got Kevin Williams to admit that he had met and talked to Bill Farrell about the lawless case and about Rick Walter. And Terry Williams would later admit that Kevin had coached her into giving him an alibi and she had done it because he was violent and she was afraid of him, stating, quote, Kevin knows who killed Michelle if he didn't do it himself, end quote. In 2018, Terry Williams sent Josh Keezer a letter apologizing, and in 2022, she sent him a message that said, quote, I'm so sorry that I let Kevin Williams manipulate me into believing that he never left the party. I was 13 when he groomed and raped me. Kevin was 19. He knew what to say and how to say it to draw me in. He took me in his truck to a dirt road and raped me. It was my first time being with anyone. Kevin Williams is a predator and knows how to groom underage girls. He is a monster, end quote. Damn, yeah. scumbag. And, you know, it's unfortunate that it took this long and it took a divorce for her to come out. Because if, you know, if she had just told the truth initially, Josh more than likely would have never been arrested in the first place. Yeah. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, they could have. Yeah, I shouldn't I say know. that. <laughs> they shouldn't say that. But, I mean, it was a big component. Because right? there was no it, reason to arrest him to begin with. Honestly. No, there was none. But it, it was a big component. So, obviously, it didn't help the situation. I think Terry knows that, which is why she's writing this letter. And she knows that he's not going to be the only one to read it. This letter is obviously going to be scanned by correctional officers before being given to him. So, clearly, she doesn't care. And she just wants to get the truth out there. She wants to clear her conscience. Yeah. And I think... um what we don't realize is she gave the alibi in 2008 and like confirmed it. But in 2009, they got a divorce. When you're yep. married to somebody like Kevin Williams, this is not a divorce that can happen in a year. This was in the making for quite a while. She had to right. steal herself. She probably tried to leave him a dozen, two dozen times and was constantly manipulated, controlled or terrified back into a relationship with him. So when you ask yourself, like, how could somebody give someone an alibi when they know that they're this messed up, when they know they're violent, when they know they're capable of murder, because you're scared, because you know they're violent, because you know they're capable of murder, because you live in their house and you're under their thumb and there's nothing you can do about it, even though you've tried a million times to remove yourself from the situation. So it's um, understandable. And I'm sure she carries that guilt with her. Yeah. And I think that's why now she's trying to do the right thing. At this point, she's trying to do the right thing. Yeah. Well, in January of 2011, when Josh Keezer had been out of prison for two years, he found a familiar name in the inbox of his Facebook messages. Kevin Williams' sister was reaching out in regards to a different wrongful conviction case that Josh was advocating for, and they ended up discussing his own conviction, at which point Josh told Kevin's sister, like, listen, there's information that your brother is connected to Michelle's murder. And it's not just Mark Abbott's statement to Bill Bonar. Like, it's other people and other things are coming out. So according to Gayla Mooney, who was Kevin Williams' girlfriend at this time, Kevin's sister sent him the messages and Kevin, like, freaked out. He immediately picked up the phone and called Bill Farrell. After he got off the phone, Kevin and Gayla got in the car and drove to the Montgomery Bank parking lot in Sykeston where they met up with Farrell. Mooney said, quote, we got out of the car, I got in the back seat of Farrell's pickup truck, and Kevin got in the passenger seat, end quote. And Mooney said that Kevin showed Farrell the Facebook messages, and Farrell told him, you've nothing to worry about. There isn't anything there, basically reassuring him. So obviously, Bill Farrell denies this meeting ever happened, but Gayla Mooney insists, why would I lie? Like, I have no reason to lie about this. In fact, like, this is putting me in a stupid position with these people that I'm coming out and speaking against, like, I have no reason to lie. Gayla also claims that when the investigation was reopened, Kevin freaked out and told her he might need to get out of the country, and he was, like, getting his passports together and stuff. So I definitely, like, okay, let's say what Gayla is saying is true, and Kevin called um, Bill Farrell when he saw the Facebook messages from Josh saying that there was other stuff tying Kevin to Michelle's murder, and he calls Bill Farrell, And they have this secret meeting in a parking lot. And Bill says, don't worry, they've got nothing. Does that sound suspicious? Or does it sound like somebody like who was maybe on the police force and was aware of the internal information and is just trying to, like, reassure somebody? Like, does this meeting in itself showcase guilt as a former law enforcement officer? Should Bill Farrell have been doing that? No, of course he shouldn't. It's completely unethical completely unethical and and you don't work for these people, right? We work on behalf of the community, but this is what I'm thinking. I have had relationships with informants and I've talked to you about this off record too, where Mm -hmm. 
it's not just a transactional thing sometimes. You do develop relationships with certain informants because I've said it before, not all criminals are bad people. Sometimes it's good people that just make bad decisions and they work off whatever they did by by working with us. And you can end up getting re- very close with some of these people. You want to protect them and make sure they're okay because you're putting them in compromising positions. It sounds to me like Bill developed a relationship with Kevin and I think it was a combination of Maybe at his core, Bill did think in his gut that Josh was good for this, uh, and also knowing that there might be some other people that could have done this, and he doesn't want it coming on them. So it's a combination of wanting to protect certain people, like Kevin Williams, who he had worked with over the years in the narcotics unit, but also not like in Josh. Claims he didn't. What? Yeah, according to him, he didn't. He definitely did. Right. And by the way, I would think there would be record of that because any informants that I had working for me. Any informants, even if it was one thing, we had to internally, maybe only two or three people had access to this file, but we had to document and sign up each and every informant. If you didn't, it's a big no, no, you can lose your job over it. But every informant that came and worked for us, there was a running log and documentation to say, hey, this person is an active informant for our for our unit. So you would think there would be a paper trail because usually there is, there is documentation, but it's sealed. So the details of Mark Abbott and Kevin Williams um, and like their convictions basically for these these drug crimes are sealed. But someone internally must know who their handler was. That's what I'm saying. Like someone those conversations, knows, yeah. somebody they're knows. Not, they're not saying though. They're not saying, but somebody knows who their handler was. So to get back to your point, no, I, I don't, this shouldn't have happened. And I do think that it's a combination of Bill knowing the investigation, you know, in and out, but also seeing a Facebook message and saying, they got nothing. He's probably just trying to spook you. This I wouldn't lose sleep over this. This guy obviously is trying to find out who did it to just, you know, to to exonerate himself even more so than he already is. And he's just throwing shit at the wall to see what sticks. Don't believe him. They got nothing. Yeah, but at this point, Bill Farrell is not the sheriff. No, no he's Kevin, out. He's on the outside looking in. And Kevin Williams is not his informant any longer. But that's what I'm saying. That relationship is still there. That and by the way, still there. But, but by the way, because I still... Have I don't know that I'm hanging out with them on the regular, but I still see some of my informants, you know, and I, you know, hey, how are you? You know what I mean? We'll talk, we'll catch up, how the kids, whatever. If one so, of your informants called you and was like, meet with me about this investigation from like 10 years ago that I'm now being like brought back into and give me like comfort that I'm not a target, would you do that? Or no, give me comfort that they don't have evidence against me? Because that's what it is. Like they've no, got nothing. He's telling no, him they don't type, have evidence against it's you. It's not that type of relationship. And it's a case that Bill worked. Right. So it's it's unethical. It's you unethical. can't do that. I've yeah. never had that happen where I was working a murder investigation and one of my informants came to me and was like, hey, am I good for this? Like, are you guys looking at me for this? But I have had situations where I've had an informant who says, you know, I got to I got a ticket over in the, the the neighboring city. Like, do you can you help me out with that, or do you know who I should go to for that? And it's like, hey man, listen, you're not on the clock right now. You got to do what you got to do. You got to be a big boy. You got to be a big girl. Handle your own shit. Don't be calling me for stuff like that. You know what I mean? Like that's it. When I'm talking about relationships now, it's more not even meetups, but more so just seeing in passing because I live in Rhode Island. It's a small state. But no, this wasn't right. He shouldn't have done it, especially a case that he had previously worked. And clearly, there's something going on for this meeting to happen in the first place, for Bill to even to agree to this meeting. Clearly, he's got something to lose as well. He doesn't want this all unraveling. So I think he's just trying to keep everyone, you know, close and together and don't lose your shit. That's basically what I think he's going for here. Yeah, like everybody follow the program. (laughs) Yeah, don't worry. They got nothing. Relax. Josh is just trying to scare you. That's what he's probably saying. So beginning in 1994, various people came forward with information about either Mark Abbott or Kevin Williams being present at or having knowledge of Michelle's murder. In the early fall of 1994, a man named Ron Burton claimed that he'd talked to Mark Abbott at the cabin of a friend in commerce. He said Mark was there with another man that he didn't know, and the conversation turned to Michelle's murder and Josh's conviction, at which point Burton claimed that Mark said they'd gotten the wrong guy for that, quote, I took care of that bitch, end quote. So Burton went to meet with Bill Farrell after this, but he claims that Farrell told him the case was closed and they had the right guy. 
On July 31st, 1995, a man called attorney Al Lowe's about Josh's conviction, and Lowe's was Josh Keezer's attorney. And the man told Lowe's secretary that Mark Abbott's friend, Kevin Williams, was a big-time drug dealer, and he'd been the one to kill Michelle Lawless. Quote, she was killed because she was mixed up with Crank. Mark probably knows something about the murder, too. Kevin threatened me. He told me he already killed one person, meaning Michelle, I guess, and he'd get me, too. End quote. The caller said that Kevin had the gun that he had used on Michelle at his body shop in commerce. Do you think that body shop in commerce was ever checked? (laughs) Not at the time, not in 1995 at least. I don't know if it was later, but by the time um, Rick Walter reopened the case in 2006, I'm sure that body shop and that gun was long gone. Yeah, definitely wasn't checked at the time. That we can guarantee. So Dwayne Klusner sold drugs with the Abbott twins and Kevin Williams in the early 90s. And he said that Mark and Kevin both claimed they knew who had really killed Michelle because they'd been there when it happened. A woman named Helen Natvig told P.I. Jim Sullins, who was working for Josh's mother, to prove his innocence, quote, I know Kevin Williams. He told my husband that Keezer is innocent. And he said he knows because he was there when she was killed. Mark is the one who shot her because she knew too much about their drug operation and she was threatening to turn them in. And quote. So when Kevin's talking, it's Mark who killed Michelle. When Mark's talking, it's Kevin who killed Michelle. Unless Mark's talking to this this other dude, Ron, um, where he's like, oh, I took care of her. So it just depends. But the, the fact that they're talking this freely at all about it lets me know that they literally thought they were like these big men on campus, these drug kingpins. Yeah. Who could just get away with anything yep. and the police brag were on about their it. payroll indirectly yeah. or directly, whatever right. it might be. They know someone and they were untouchable. Right. Let's take a quick break. We'll be right back. Have you ever been on the hunt for a new doctor and you ask everyone you know for their recommendations? You know, a doctor who actually gets you, listens to you, and makes you feel super comfortable. And finally, after weeks of searching, you find the one. So you call their office, they have an appointment available, but then the receptionist tells you the perfect doctor doesn't take your insurance. Well, wipe your tears, put away the ice cream, and head over to ZocDoc to find and book the doctor who is right for you and who takes your insurance. ZocDoc is a free app where you can find amazing doctors and book appointments online. We're talking about booking appointments with thousands of top-rated, patient-reviewed doctors and specialists. You can filter specifically for ones who take your insurance, are located near you, and treat almost any condition you're searching for. And these doctors all have verified reviews from actual real patients, not bots. The average wait time to see a doctor booked on ZocDoc is between just 24 to 48 hours. That's it. You can even sometimes score same-day appointments. And once you find the doctor you want, you can book them immediately with just a few app taps. No more waiting awkwardly on hold with a receptionist. ZocDoc has honestly made finding all of my doctors recently the most easiest streamlined experience in the world, which it never has been before. So I definitely endorse using the app and how easy it is and how successful I've been in finding doctors that are right for treating whatever issue I'm dealing with. So we love ZocDoc. We think you will too. Derek's going to tell you how you can check them out for your yourself. That's right. If we had a need for a product like this, this is exactly what we would use. And if you want to check it out, go to ZocDoc.com slash Crime Weekly and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top rated doctor today. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash Crime Weekly. Once again, ZocDoc.com slash Crime Weekly. A woman named Paula Cornell claimed she knew someone called Donna Sue Robinson who had claimed to have known Michelle. And Michelle had allegedly told Robinson that she was dating Mark Abbott and that she had told him she was pregnant with his baby. Donna Sue believed that Mark had found out about the pregnancy and had Michelle killed over it. Jim Sullins could not verify Donna Sue Robinson's story because she'd been found dead on the side of the highway with a balloon of meth in her throat, her body having been tossed from a vehicle. On July 18, 1999, a woman called Al Lowe's office and talked to his secretary, and she said that Kevin Williams had shot Michelle over drugs. He had told Michelle he wanted his money or he wanted the drugs back, and Mark was supposed to have been the one to have shot Michelle, but he had chickened out, so Kevin had to do it. A woman named Kathy Fowler also called Al Lowe's office, claiming that in 1996, Kevin Williams had been saying he and Mark Abbott had killed Michelle. She said, quote, It all happened when I was married to Jimmy Joe Fowler. Jimmy Joe hung around Kevin Williams and Mark Abbott. He was kind of involved in their drug business, end quote. And as we'll come to find, a lot of people in this area are kind of involved. 
in this drug business, including, as it would you know, turn out, Ray Ring, who was the guy that Mark said he saw that night in the parking lot of the Cut Mart. And as it turns out, Ray Ring worked running drugs for Mark Abbott. His name's brought up in the indictments and stuff. So they're just all kind of connected here. So Kathy Fowler claimed that Kevin had been at her house when he said that Josh was innocent and that Mark Abbott had killed Michelle Lawless. On August 19th, 2006, Jim Sullen spoke to Margie Fowler. This was a woman who was married to Jerry Fowler, who knew a lot of individuals involved in the meth ring, including the Abbots and Kevin Williams. Margie said she was aware of the rumors that Kevin and Mark had killed Michelle. And the night of Michelle's murder, Margie's then boyfriend, Brian Conklin, had gotten a call from Mark Abbott. Margie and Brian went to pick Mark up from a truck stop and they drove him back to his car, which was in Sykeston. We also have some people who claim that Michelle did know Mark Abbott. Melissa Elliott had known Michelle in high school, and she said the summer before Michelle was murdered, Michelle had stopped by Melissa's job to give her some flowers for her birthday. And at that time, Michelle told Melissa that she had met Mark Abbott and she thought he was cute. And she also said that Mark had given her the same type of flowers that Michelle was now giving to Melissa. And Melissa told her, listen, the Abbott boys are trouble. Stay away from them. Melissa's mother, Lauren, also claimed that she'd heard Michelle and Melissa talking about Mark Abbott in 1992. And Lauren, who worked at the M&M Diner in Benton and who had regular interactions with the Abbott twins because it was one of the places they would hang out, she also advised Michelle to steer clear of Mark. So Sheriff Rick Walter was heavily involved with helping Josh Keezer eventually be exonerated in February of 2009. Finding the multiple Brady violations in Deputy Brenda Schwitz's notebook didn't hurt. And the judge who oversaw the case ended up stating, quote, There is little about this case which recommends our criminal justice system. The system failed in the investigative and charging stage. It failed at trial and it failed at the post-trial review and it failed during the appellate process. Tragically, for the family of Michelle Lawless, the real killer or killers remain at large, end quote. So P.I. Jim Sullins had also spoken to Chantal Kreider, the surprise prosecution witness who had pointed to Josh Keezer during his trial and said she was 100 percent sure he was the one who'd been drunk and angry with Michelle the night of the Halloween party. It turns out that Chantel, who claimed she had not known Mark Abbott at the time of Josh's trial, had come to know him quite well afterwards since her husband at that time, David Franklin, had been one of the Abbott's dealers. Chantel and David used meth themselves, and she claimed that one night not long after Josh's trial had wrapped up, she and David had been out driving when he told her he had to make a stop to see a friend. That friend was Mark Abbott, and over the next year, she saw Abbott frequently, claiming that she saw a lot of the drug dealing going down and also stating that Mark had forced her to snort amphetamine once. In her position as David Franklin's wife, Chantel became privy to some inner workings, and sometimes they talked about Michelle, suggesting that she had known information about their drug dealing. Chantel told Sullins, quote, I heard them talk about how she'd never talk again and that they wanted to do me the same way because they didn't want me talking. They, you know, were afraid I was going to expose it because I found out by overhearing and what I just happened to come upon and see, end quote. Chantel said that Mark Abbott would sometimes take her for unexpected rides late at night into isolated areas to scare her. And Chantel was not the only woman to report these types of fear tactics, because according to the Lawless Files podcast, Bob Miller had talked to an ex-girlfriend of Matt Abbott's who wanted to remain anonymous. She claimed that one day they were watching the news when it was announced that Josh Keezer had been found guilty. And she made a comment like, I know Josh used to babysit for him, like, there's no way he did this. I believe he's innocent. And she kind of would talk sometimes about Josh being innocent. And at this time, Matt Abbott became very angry and he cut off all contact with her. But on New Year's Eve 1994, she was hoping they would rekindle things when they saw each other out at the Purple Crackle and Matt seemed interested in bringing her home. Now, this woman claims that she was drinking that night, so it took her a minute to realize the man who was taking her home from the club was not Matt Abbott. It was his brother, Mark, and he was not taking her home. She claimed she was forced into Mark's truck where another man was waiting. She says she believes this man was Kevin Williams, but she can't be 100 percent sure because she didn't know Kevin. Mark and this other man drove her over to the Benton exit. They turned onto the exit ramp and drove slowly on the overpass towards Farrell Mobile Home Sales Lot. 
They asked if she knew where they were, and then they told her to stop talking about Josh Keezer being innocent, and if she didn't keep her mouth shut, she would end up just like Michelle Lawless. But quickly, back to Chantel. Not only did she tell Jim Sullins that she was now 100% sure Josh was not the boy she'd seen at the Halloween party, she said she'd made an honest mistake, but now she claimed that Mark and Matt Abbott had both been at the Worley trailer on Halloween night. They'd been wearing black and white face paint. So I don't even know if that's true. I don't know if they were there. I don't know if we can trust Chantel and like who she says was at this party at this point. But I think it's an interesting. She says she did not know Mark Abbott before the trial or like during the trial. It was only after that her new husband, David, started bringing her around. But it's worth noting that Chantel got married to David Franklin who worked with the Abbott brothers a month before Josh's trial. And I find it hard to believe that Chantel and Josh just met that month and then got married within like a week. They probably knew each other and had been talking to each other and, you know, hanging out for a couple months before, I hope. But either way, she knew David before the trial. So this is just speculation, She may have been threatened to go on the stand at the trial and be a surprise witness and say that Josh was at the Halloween party threatening Michelle, whether she was threatened by the Abbott brothers, whether she was threatened by Bill Farrell, the sheriff. Somebody got to her and made her be a surprise witness at this trial, in my opinion. Just my opinion. I don't know if that's It's obviously could definitely be the case but i will say this one thing i'm i'm hearing throughout this episode and i know we joked about it a little earlier as far as like you know you're a big dog on you know Mm -hmm. in the pound when you're out in the uh, you know out in the world but then when you get in prison or whatever you're you know just a, a a small fish in a big pond from someone who's done this a long time i will say it appears that the operation the meth operation that was taking place was pretty elaborate pretty expansive and the real deal it was the real deal. People were being killed over this. People that we don't even know. That's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking there's a lot more to this than we, we as we even sit here, we're talking about Michelle, but I don't feel Michelle's the only victim here. And I, the reason I say this is because, you know, we keep trying to pinpoint a motive and it couldn't be, it could have been a variety of things, right? It could have been a totality of things that led to this. It could have been a combination of Mark having a relationship with Michelle and being careless with her like he was allegedly with this other girl, you know, bringing her into different locations where he was storing narcotics, storing Mm -hmm. money, uh, having her be present during phone conversations when they were together that she shouldn't have been present for. Maybe she was aware of some of the individuals that were working with Mark that may have had a career in law enforcement or in the you know political or even field. customers, customers, just individuals mm-hmm. who were involved that Michelle should not have known about. But at the time, you know, Mark's not thinking about that. He's thinking that I'm going to hang out with this girl forever. Um, so he's doing his business in front of her. And then you could also have a situation where as things are going a little bit more south. Maybe Michelle makes a comment about her being pregnant to to him and to some other people. So this is how it all comes to a head where he's realizing this person is no longer uh, safe to be out there. Yeah. And she she has a big mouth. And this is going to be something that ruins me. I can't have her out there walking around doing what she's doing, talking like she's talking. Um, I know we're going to have a final recap at the end. So we'll, we'll I'll save the rest for then. But overall, my main takeaway as we stand here right now... This isn't some little mom and pop, you know, meth deal working out of a little uh, mobile home or trailer in, in, in the park where it's these two guys. It who was are pretty up. expansive. I think Bob Bob Miller referred to it as a breaking bad of Southeast Missouri. And I didn't feel I didn't know that when we first started. I think in, I th- I'm thinking to, uh, you know, Mark and Matt are these country bumpkins and they're just kind of doing it in their back lot, you know, in their little garage or whatever. And they're just supplying the local people. Now this, you know, you started talking about that woman, and I apologize, I can't remember her name. Who was found but, on the side of the road yep, with a was, balloon of meth in her throat? That's a mule. <laughs> I mean, right. they're starting to move b- balloons of meth. Right. That means it's not only in and that she's area. Not the only one, like a ton of people. Like I can't even get into it because, like I said, it would be like twelve part series. You guys need to go listen to the Lawless Files podcast yeah. if you want more information about all of these like side quests. But there's um a guy by the last name of Clay 
who was set up for a murder, basically, that, yeah, it, that, it's big high, that it's highly believed Kevin Williams and Mark Abbott committed with the same gun that they used on Michelle, allegedly, if that's what happened. Um, this person clearly, I think I read I read a lot about this person's case. I Like I said, it would be a whole episode in its own. Um, and I clearly believe that he was set. I definitely think he was set up. And I couldn't say who set him up, but he was involved with the Abbots, knew them, um, worked for them in, in that capacity. So there's so much. And you're right. Yep. Like you can be two stupid idiots and still run you know, a successful meth operation for a few years because that's yeah. what it was. It was like the early 90s and then they got busted in like the mid 90s. So it wasn't like this long extravagant operation that they hit undercover. I wonder why, because they run their mouths like nobody else, yeah, there weren't like little freaking schoolgirls. And that's another thing. What seems is happening here is these guys are very free with the people that they're around because they're young, they're braggadocious. They want everybody to know like I'm the king, but then they get stressed out and worried and then people die. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Because you were you just were bragging and talking and then you thought better of it. And later you were probably laying in bed like, damn, I probably shouldn't have been that open around that chick. Now she's got to go. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah, definitely seems expansive. Definitely seems like this might have gone over state lines even. I mean, they were mules and stuff. They were bringing the meth in from California, first of all. There you go. So, I mean, this is a very elaborate and uh, for, for dare I say impressive operation mm. for a short period of time where yeah, they were pushing m- massive amounts of drugs and also probably making massive amounts of money. So that was another thing, because when Kevin Williams was arrested at that motel with his girlfriend, he went to the, he went to the police station. He called his wife, Terry, and he was like, yo, I got some money taped under our trailer. Go get that shit. It was like twenty one thousand dollars. And so she goes and gets it, but then the police show up and they, because they, once they arrest him and they take the money from her. So now the police are looking at this $21,000 and they're like, this isn't some small operation. This guy's yeah. moving a lot of weight. So then they bring the money back to him and they're like, Kevin, there's $21,000 here. You're moving a lot of weight. You need to tell us we already know something's up. And that's when he broke. Yeah. Yeah. Very, yeah. very elaborate operation. Did not expect that, but here we are. And it does make a lot more sense when you think about or you ask the question, why are people dying over this? There's a lot of players in this game and with a lot of people with a lot to lose. Uh, let's take our final break and we'll, we'll wrap this episode up. All right. So everyone knows how much I love Skims. It all started with their Fits Everybody collection of the butteriest underwear ever. So I wanted to try more from their brand. I'm always seeing their cotton loungewear all over my feed on TikTok, on Instagram. So I had to see for myself what all the hype was about. And let me tell you, they did not disappoint. These are the cutest and most flattering sets you'll find to wear in or out of the house. Skims is creating the next generation of loungewear for everybody. And this cotton collection loungewear is no exception. I love it so much that after they sent me a few pieces, I went and bought a few more. I love the cotton jersey scoop bralette, which I did not think that I would because I usually like a little bit more support, but it is supportive, but it's also comfortable. It feels like you're wearing nothing. I love the um, cotton rib boxers, the cotton rib leggings. Usually cotton rib leggings, I'm always worried that they're not going to be thick enough and then it's kind of going to be like an uncomfortable thing and I won't be able to wear them out, but these are thick while being light and not overheating at the same time. And I love the colors I got. I got almost everything in kyanite, which is this beautiful blue color, but I also got a couple of things in mineral, which is a little bit of a greener color. And they're just lovely. They go together so well. The boxers are super cute too. And I just love them. And the cotton collection is Skim's most tagged collection. It's made with classic cotton fabric for comfortable everyday wear, made from ultra soft and natural fibers, and it features elevated lounge pieces designed for comfort indoors and outside. And Whoever said loungewear was only for the house hasn't tried Skims. I would feel perfectly comfortable and feel that I would look stylish and put together walking out of my house wearing these things. And the cotton collection is available in sizes extra, extra small to 4X. So I love Skims. Derek's going to tell you how you can check them out for yourself right now. That's right. Believe the hype. Skims has over 100,000 five-star reviews for a reason. The cotton collection and more are available at skims.com. Plus, get free shipping on orders over $75. If you haven't yet, please make sure to let them know that we sent you. After you place your order, select podcast from the survey and select our show in the drop down menu that follows. Once again, go check them out. We love them. Think you will as well. Skims.com. 
With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh pre portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. And that's why it's America's number one meal kit. You can now kickstart a fresh fall routine with HelloFresh. HelloFresh is going to handle all your meal planning and shopping to deliver everything you need to cook up a tasty meal right at home. So you don't have to worry about planning dinners. You don't have to worry about going to the grocery store. We don't have time for that right now. HelloFresh is going to do the hard work for you and you get to take the credit. And when it comes to options, honestly, more is more. That's why HelloFresh's menu includes 40 recipes and over 100 add-on items to choose from every week. And a new season calls for new meals, so HelloFresh has a fresh fall lineup of delicious dinners and more to choose from. Take your pick from 40 weekly recipes that suit your lifestyle, from veggie to family-friendly to fit and wholesome. And HelloFresh is more than just dinners. You can also stock your fridge with easy breakfasts, quick lunches, and fresh snacks. Just shop the HelloFresh market and add on any of these tasty time-saving solutions to your weekly box. And when you get HelloFresh, you know you're getting top-notch products since all of the ingredients travel from the farm to your door in less than seven seven days. And then you have exactly what you need for each recipe. And you have these recipe cards that have step-by-step instructions and pictures. So they are impossible to mess up. And if I say that, you know that it is true. So we love HelloFresh. I know Derek and I have been both using HelloFresh and cooking with HelloFresh for, I mean, I've been using it since 2020. Derek's definitely been using it for at least almost two years now. But regardless, we love it. We endorse it. We use it. And he's going to tell you how you can check it out for yourself. That's right. Just go to HelloFresh.com slash 50 Crime Weekly and use our code 50 Crime Weekly for 50% off plus 15% off the next two months. One more time. That's HelloFresh.com slash 50 Crime Weekly. Use our code 50 Crime Weekly to get 50% off plus 15% off the next two months. We love HelloFresh. We think you will as well. Go check them out. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. So in 2009, Sheriff Rick Walter had DNA testing done on Michelle's sweatshirt. It was touch DNA testing. And this focused on areas where an attacker may have grabbed her. The analysis revealed a mixture of three DNA profiles along with Michelle's own DNA profile. And one of these profiles was a match to Mark and Matt Abbott with the exception of one allele. Now, according to the book, The Murder of Angela Michelle Lawless, quote, the touch DNA on Michelle's sweatshirt that matched the Abbott's seemed consistent with Mark Abbott's story that he lifted Michelle up from the seat of her car when he found her. But Mark Abbott had said he'd lifted Michelle by the left shoulder and the Abbott touch DNA was on her right side. More significantly, the Abbott DNA was on the inside of Michelle's right arm. That location was more consistent with someone grabbing her roughly around the arm than lifting her by the shoulders, end quote. Sheriff Walter also had reconstruction experts test Mark Abbott's story about what had happened that night, that he'd reached through Michelle's partially open window to lift her. And the data said, obviously, that would have been impossible based on how all the police officers on the scene referred to Michelle's window being not even half the way down. The following year, Walter began working with a forensic scientist, Dr. John Bond, who had invented a fingerprint detection technique where prints could be found on metal surfaces by analyzing corrosion caused by fingerprint sweat. Bond tested the shell casings found in Michelle's car. As far as I could tell, the findings of whatever they they found on the shell casings were never revealed. Real real quick before you continue, because I can see what's coming and I want I don't there's a lot of really interesting stuff you're saying right now. You know, I love this stuff. Um. First off, when we're talking about you know touch DNA, for anybody who didn't pick up on it, because I know I was sitting here trying to figure it out as you're describing it, Mark has always told us that he walks up on the car, she's already in there, she's already slumped over, there's a small opening, he basically reaches in through the opening, grabs her, what would be her left arm, and lifts her up a little bit, and then you know he he steps away. Yes. What the kind of just the, to straighten her so he could see better, and, and he, right. then he figured out she was like limp and dead, and then he that's let her right. go because he was scared. Yeah, which is fine. Even though let's just let's just say that the window was open enough where he could at least reach his arm in there, although law enforcement has all said it wasn't enough. But just for the sake of this argument, let's say the window was open enough. What the what the evidence is telling us, which is unbiased, which is objective, which doesn't change over time, the evidence is telling us that his DNA was not found on her left shoulder. It was found on her right shoulder. So in order for that to be true, he would have had to have reached into the car and through the small opening. Mm-hmm. And reached past her left arm, 
past her chest and then grabbed her by the right shoulder, which would be facing the passenger seat. And on and the then inside of her, her arm, too. It was like yeah, on the in inside a, of her arm. Think about that. Think about that for a second. Does that make any sense to you? No, no. it does not. No. Which that would lead any reasonable person to believe that he had a prior contact with her either before putting before being in the car or maybe outside the car away from the vehicle in the in the grassy area on the side of the road it doesn't match up that's not or us I mean speculating. anything right he could even say no that didn't get there that day well what other day would it have gotten there then because you said you didn't he know, doesn't know her. her you don't that's know the problem. her that's the first time you ever saw her how did your dna get on the other side of her body that's right that's the problem he he created his own rope to hang himself. That's yeah. not us. Mm -hmm. That's him putting him in that corner. He's not giving him an out where that evidence, that DNA could have gotten there any other way. He doesn't know this woman, according to him. So we can only go off what he's telling us. And what he's telling us is that he grabbed her by the right shoulder, lifted her up. The oh, left I'm not shoulder, touching this. her left shoulder. I'm sorry. I apologize. Her left shoulder. Yeah. But instead, we have evidence that suggests she was lifted or at least grabbed by her right shoulder, which is his his arms probably wouldn't even be physically long enough with the window being open the way it was. You'd have to, to, he'd have to reach his whole upper body in there, right? Like yeah. to the waist. I agree. It doesn't make sense. And but I know you got the, more coming. As far as the uh, fingerprint too, real quick, the fact that they haven't put anything out, this it's really hard to get it off a metal surface like that because you will have some, I mean, it's a really, it's, it's a shot in the dark. It's not going to get it all the time. So the fact that they didn't come out with anything, unfortunately, there might not be anything there because if they got a print off that and it belonged to one of these characters, I would like to think if anybody but Bill Farrell learned about it, we would know about it by now. <laughs> Just saying, Bill. <laughs> Sorry, Bill, but it's true. <laughs> Just saying, bud. Okay. Yeah. I mean, they may have like gotten a partial print. They may have done something and they're Smudge. still analyzing yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. You need a certain amount of points to identify someone. Fingerprints are hard, man. They, they're they hard. Yeah. Well, in 2013, the body of Michelle Lawless was exhumed in order to test her body for DNA. Rick Walter had decided to go this route after reading the original autopsy report and noticing references to non-lethal wounds on Michelle's arms. Some of these wounds looked like fingernail scratches, and the plan was to test those to see if the killer had left behind his DNA, with Rick Walter telling the Daily Journal that they'd had the technology to do that at the time of Michelle's murder, but for some reason that testing had not been done. He literally says for some reason the testing was not done. Like, it's a, it's a, it's a subtle jab. Yep. What do I always them. say? That? What are they saying without saying it? Yeah. So the forensic lab took 45 samples from various areas of Michelle's body, which was in good condition. But this testing gave no results. And this was most likely because the coroner had ended up cleaning Michelle's wounds and filling the fingernail scratch areas with like this waxy substance. So, you know, it's, it's just going to be diluted and kind of corrupted. But Walter did say they'd kept these samples because DNA technology was advancing every single day. And he hoped there would come a time when they could yield some results. And there still might. As we know, when we went to um, the the lab in Colorado, no, when we went to the Utah. lab in Utah, which was Intermountain Forensics, yep. they're just, it's, I mean, leaps and bounds. DNA technology every is year. growing. Yeah, Yeah, it's crazy. In 2017, Mark Abbott announced that he was tired of all the bullshit and he and his twin brother, Matt, agreed to take polygraphs to prove their innocence, even though that is not what polygraphs do, but OK. By this time, Rick Walter was no longer sheriff. He'd been replaced by Wes Drury. Remember Wes Drury? Oh, the yeah. The dude that saw saw Matt Abbott at the sheriff's office. But then it, Matt was like, it wasn't me, it was Mark, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So... They just kind of, I guess, hire and promote from within. Matt Abbott claimed that his brother Mark had been pressured by Bill Farrell into testifying. And when Mark had picked Josh's picture out of a lineup, an investigator from the Missouri Highway State Patrol had already informed Mark that, the, that their suspect in this case was in the lineup. Matt also said that he did not know Michelle before he was shown her photo by the police, but later he made a claim that Michelle was known to be promiscuous, so any number of her partners could be responsible for her death. Rick Walter felt this was an odd statement to make, considering Matt Abbott said he had no idea who Michelle was, and he had made both of these statements before the trial. And he could have, now, like— this is Matt and Mark. Yeah. Okay. Now, okay. Matt, like, to be fair, could have just heard around town because it's a small town that, like, Michelle was, you know, sleeping with a lot of guys at the time. So he could have made that statement then. But still, as it turns out, the results of the polygraphs that Mark and Matt took were never released. And they actually paid for these to happen. So this was something that they did, which is why they have chosen <laughs> 
not to release the results, which is a funny thing to do when you say you're taking them to prove your innocence. Yeah. So what did the apparently results they say Googled, then? Apparently what they Googled to kind of beat a polygraph didn't work. Yeah, because I'm saying like if those polygraphs had said you were not lying, they'd be all over the place, all right. over. And it could have been a statement analysis test where they just gave an overall statement and then the poly- polygrapher starts asking them about that statement in its entirety. So even if they're telling the truth in 90% of it, mm-hmm. if they're asked is everything in the statement that you gave today true, even if just one thing they're lying about, even though it's amongst a lot of truthful things, if you don't trick it right, it's still going to it's still going to pop you for, for deception. And apparently, I think Mark took like one of those voice stress test analysis and that showed deception. But yeah. Rick Walter later was like, I don't even believe like I don't believe polygraphs. I don't believe these voice stress things like they're not reliable anyways. So it, it doesn't really matter. But I think it's very telling that they didn't release mm. the results. Now, Rick Walter had attempted to call a grand jury twice, once in 2015 and once in 2016 after this new evidence started coming to light. Both times he claims he was denied by Scott County Prosecutor Paul Boyd. Walter left office in 2016 and the following year, a grand jury was convened to hear evidence in the lawless case. This grand jury did not return an indictment, allegedly, even though we don't know what the grand jury actually says. Right. We just hear from the prosecutor that they didn't return an indictment. We don't really know what was presented. Like, we don't know who testified, things like that. So here's what Rick Walter has said about this, quote, in mid-year 2015, we presented the case to Paul Boyd and he was agreeable to taking it to a grand jury. He told me he would seat a grand jury and give them a couple smaller cases to get them seasoned. Then he would give them the lawless case. But 2015 passed and he did not give it to a grand jury. In summer of 2016, Paul told my detective that he would not move on this case until after the election, the sheriff election, he means. In fall of 2016, Paul, my detective, and I met together with the court. The court suggested that we needed to move on this case sooner rather than later and advised me that I could submit a probable cause affidavit and seek warrants if I saw fit. We again discussed a grand jury, and again, Paul did not convene one. Seeing that a grand jury was not seated before I left office, my office submitted a probable cause affidavit. I submitted the probable cause affidavit because Paul had delayed the case so many times that I did not know if he would ever seat a grand jury. With all the tactics and delays, it seems the long delay on prosecuting this case is politically motivated. And if that's true, it's a real shame and an injustice to Michelle's family and the people of Scott County, end quote. So politically motivated, I think he means, as in like he was waiting for me to not be sheriff anymore. He was waiting for me to not be involved in this so that I would not have a say in what was presented to the grand jury. Yeah, not good. Terrible. Because we do have these things happen where I've I've traveled around the country in certain cities and states. Pittsburgh was one of them. Uh, Cody Joyce case. Uh, They had an AG over there who... Just you give them all this information and it all matched up to everybody else. But for some reason, there was this delay in a lot of things. And as I started to pull back the layers, um, it's I was finding connections amongst um, the potential offenders, their parents and and the AG. And and uh, it's just a terrible thing, which is why it was rare for me. I actually went to Pittsburgh and spoke out publicly in front of the media against the police department and the AG because – I could tell I was I had been around long enough to know that something wasn't smelling right. And I, I, that was the only recourse I had, which I try to avoid because you need to work with these people because unfortunately they have complete control. So uh, I can see what he's saying here. And I wish I could say I I don't relate to him in some way, shape or form. But unfortunately, I do. And he's not he's not wrong. It does happen. And I mean, it does seem like why don't you just call it? You know, the courts said do it sooner than later. The evidence is piling up. There you go. Why? It's why not, wouldn't you? Yeah, it's not an end all be all trial. It's just going to give you an indication of whether you're ready to go to trial or not. Like, what are you waiting for? So if all the evidence is there, then it has to be something else, which is why he's insinuating it was politically motivated, because there's nothing within the case that wouldn't without you wouldn't at least take a shot at it. Worst case scenario, they say no true bill. Yes. And according to the Southeast Missourian, they discovered in 2018 that at least three key witnesses were not presented during that 2017 grand jury, including a DNA expert, the one who had done the touch DNA and could explain the technology and reliability of touch DNA, the crime reconstruction experts that Walters had brought in to show that Mark Abbott was lying about what he claimed happened the night he discovered Michelle Lawless's body, and Terry Williams, the ex-wife of Kevin Williams, who had retracted his alibi. So, Clearly, this prosecutor sort of omitted a lot of the people who could explain the evidence that was the most important. Yeah. 
just I don't get it. According to Rick Walter and the experts he hired after reopening the case, here are the indisputable facts. Michelle Lawless pulled her car over on the exit ramp between Interstate 55 and Highway 77 in Benton around midnight on November 18, 1992. She rolled down her window, which was consistent with talking to someone, and then exited her vehicle. She was found dead in the front seat, the victim of three gunshot wounds. The shell casings of three 38 caliber bullets were found in her car. She had also sustained multiple other wounds from being struck, including including one to her head, which was consistent with the butt of a gun. Two blood trails were found going down a slope. The grass at the bottom of that slope was depressed, consistent with a struggle. DNA of Leon Lamb was found under Michelle's fingernails, but he was the last person to admit seeing Michelle alive that night, and he attributes the DNA being under her nails to the sex that they had. Matt and Mark Abbott have admitted too often switching places, claiming to be the other. Mark Abbott told the police he touched Michelle's shoulder when he found her dead. Michelle knew Mark and Matt Abbott based on interviews conducted with her friends. Later, Mark Abbott would tell police officer Bill Bonart that Kevin Williams had killed Michelle. So those are, according to Walter and the experts, these are things we know to be true. Now, Walter has claimed that these following statements are based on evidence. They're likely, but not provable. Michelle knew her attackers because her family and friends claimed she was unlikely to pull over for someone she did not know. She was struck outside of her car, and at least two and possibly three people were responsible for her murder. Rick Walter has a theory about what happened to Michelle on that fateful night, a theory which is supported by the DNA and reconstruction experts. The evidence, including the blood trail, showed that Michelle had an altercation outside of her car on the grassy embankment along the northbound exit ramp. Her body was then placed in the front seat of her vehicle where she regained consciousness and then was shot three times. The touch DNA showed grip marks on Michelle, and this, according to the touch DNA experts, shows forceful contact. They said this is not like somebody being tapped on the shoulder. This is somebody being grabbed, somebody yeah. fighting with somebody else. Well, think about it. It would be, if you're, if you're visually picturing it, it would be basically like a thumbprint or something underneath the arm and then the four fingers above it. So it's not yeah. like just someone swiping their hand across your right. shoulder or tapping you on the back. They found There's, grip marks, right? Yeah, that you can see the the marks, the, the trace DNA going around the arm uh, with the, with someone's hand. Yep. So if, you know, since Mark had claimed he'd only touched Michelle on the left shoulder, if touch DNA was found anywhere else on her body that was, you know, attributed to him, that was going to be a problem, which it was. Since Josh Keezer's 2009 exoneration, both Mark Abbott and Kevin Williams have been named as suspects. And this past summer, a special prosecutor from an outside office has been assigned to look into Michelle's death. But honestly, I'm unhopeful that anything will happen just simply because of how much time has passed and how much physical evidence was lost during the time when that investigation should have been properly conducted and wasn't. And that's where we're at. Yeah, so I was saying that we'll hold it off for kind of our recap at the end, but I think for the first time, I don't really think we need to recap much because you just did it. And I think Rick Walter did a great job of describing it as far as what we know for certain and what is highly likely. And everything there suggests that Mark Abbott, Kevin Williams were involved in in Michelle's death. And I think this, the scenario that he laid out is, is highly probable. And I think that's why they were publicly named suspects because there's nothing exculpatory in what has been presented. Anything that was exculpatory has been retracted, which is why, which is why Josh was in the position he was in. And, you know, it's unfortunate that it took all these years to get there. And I know you're not as hopeful and you're probably right, but I, I am optimistic that with the advancements in DNA, the fact that they had DNA on certain parts of her body already, that if there's more DNA, maybe on her pants or on some other location, maybe with the new technology today, that those smaller amounts of DNA that weren't detectable back then could be detected now, even suggesting further struggle. For example, if they find touch DNA from Mark or Kevin on her pants or on her shoes or some other part of her body that was caused during the struggle, that's even more of an indication that there was something that occurred before Mark Abbott allegedly walked up to the car and reached inside. But I think the scenario he laid out, highly likely, and I finally feel like we have a, a, a strong answer to why Michelle would pull over. I don't necessarily believe that there was like this assassination attempt where there was a guy at the top of the overpass waiting for her car to come, flashing them down, and they kind of blocked her off. 
I think exactly what they're saying is most likely the situation. She's leaving Leon's house some way or another. Mark and Kevin are driving back from wherever they are and they see Michelle. They may have been drinking, whatever the case may be. They flash their lights. She pulls over, maybe initially just to talk because Mark gets out of the car. She rolls down her window. He's like, hey, what are you up to? They get out of the car. The conversation escalates. An altercation ensues. Michelle's severely injured during that struggle. Mark's realizing what just went down. They know that she knows way too much, not only about him, but also their operations. And now, if there wasn't enough incentive before for her to say anything, he just beat her up. He just hit her with a gun, whatever the case may be. So even if the intent at that moment was not to kill her, realizing that they can't let her leave because she's probably going to go tell everyone what, what they're up to, they make a decision. And it doesn't sound like this was the first time they made a decision like this. So I thought Rick did a great job putting it all together. And unfortunately, in certain cases, it's hard to uh, get that final step because it's up to people who may not have the best intentions. And I do think Josh Keezer's conviction really does hinder this case. Even though he's completely been cleared, to go to a grand jury or to even go to trial now, knowing that although these guys that were initially involved are not the same guys that are involved now, it's going to be a really hard mountain to climb when you're saying, hey, listen, we're 100% convinced that it's this guy. When years earlier, you were 100 when I say you, that's your department, maybe not you individually, but your department was 100% convinced that you had the right guy before. And I think a jury is going to have a hard time convicting another man of a crime that a, one man has already served a prison sentence for. So that's, that's, that's a major issue. And I think I said that in Josh's episode where mm -hmm. even unless you have a confession, it's going to be hard for a jury to convict someone, even with this mountain of evidence. Yeah. Do you think that, like, I think it really was connected to the drugs more than anything. Like, I think the pregnancy thing just became something people a started spreading around after they you know heard kind of what Michelle was doing mm -hmm. and it just seemed like convenient yep but i think it definitely had to do with drugs and i don't think it was like oh kevin wanted to talk to her i think kevin and mark are both like we got to we got to like end this because yeah. she's a danger now and they decided jointly to do something about it yeah i agree i think it could have started the conversation where maybe mark and, and michelle are having a sexual relationship Mark's doing it purely for the sex and maybe Michelle says at some point, like I'm pregnant and he's like, well, I'm getting away from this. This is bad news. So they're already on the outs, but Mark, as you said before in the episode, like he's starting to replay a lot of the conversations that she was present for things that she's witnessed. And he's feeling uneasy about her still being out there walking around, talking to people, doing whatever. And Maybe she even said something to someone who knows, or maybe he thought that she said something to someone. So he wanted to confront her about it because, you know, again, if, if it was a, uh, if it started off as a good conversation, I don't think she would have even gotten out of the car. I think it was more like get out of the fucking car. You oh, know, I think there was, yeah. I don't think this was like, Hey, how are you? I think they were probably, if this happened, they were flashing her down aggressively, like telling her, pull over to the side of the road right now. She was probably scared. Mm -hmm. I don't think this was started as like a, hey, what's up? Pull over. Right. There was something that happened on that highway where she didn't feel she had a choice or not to pull over. And I so agree. she pulls over. Someone rolls up on the car. Get out of the car now. Why? What's going on? Get out of the car. And there you go. That's the rest of the story plays out. But yeah. just for legal reasons, I, I will say. They're suspects, but they haven't been found guilty of anything in the court of law. There's an there's an abundance of evidence that doesn't bode well for them, and clearly mm -hmm. they know that, which is why they paid for polygraph tests. Um, we're but only pointing reveal. out the facts. <laughs> yeah. We're only pointing out the facts. We yeah. don't need any vigilantes out there harassing them or doing anything. But overall, our opinion, or I'll speak for me, my opinion is they, they clearly know what happened that night, and mm -hmm. um, will we ever get justice? I don't know. We're going to probably need a, a major break in the case, not from a witness, but more so from science itself. That's mm -hmm. indisputable. That can be presented to a jury. Yeah, I agree. And that's why I'm just really not hopeful at this point, especially with a lot of people in the area being of local law enforcement that just didn't don't want this dug back up. They don't well, want it to. to it's you know, already a black eye. Yeah. Especially now that Josh is out. So now they don't even have that guilt that he's like sitting in prison. Yeah. So they're like, well, you know, nobody, no harm, no foul. Let's just move on. We don't want to talk about this anymore. 
I do feel like there's a change occurring in law enforcement slower than mm-hmm. it should be, but a change where police are more willing to to call out other police officers. Yes. And we see it all. We're seeing it more often now where cops are not protecting their their former you know people that were in their departments because we're all individuals and we understand that not everyone's created equally. And we're having a lot of task force created to go back and redo the work of their predecessors because they didn't do it right. And I feel like as time progresses to build transparency within the community, we, ha- we being cops, have to police our own. That's the only way we gain back that trust, by mm-hmm. calling out those who did it wrong before us. And I do think there's still an apprehension, but it's slowly changing based on what's happening in the world. And as time progresses, we'll get to a point where, you know, it's not this quote unquote brotherhood. Uh, we're all individuals, even though we might wear the same uniform. And if you screw up, I'm going to call you out on it. And it may not end well for you, but I'm not going down with the ship as far as this like form of secrecy. But again, far way away from it. We got a long way to go, but we'll get there. I I hope at least one day. Yeah, I think that because we still have like people like West Drury, like, you know, running the show and things like that, it's going to be a little bit slower in, in this scenario. But Eventually. And it looks like they're trying to do stuff now, yeah. but you just never know. Honestly, you, you never just never know. know. You never know. And with body cam, this is a deeper conversation, but with mm-hmm. body cams, there's less opportunity to do things like this because now even not having your body cam turned on is an offense by the policy. So yeah. we're getting to a point where we're acknowledging, hey, listen, police officers have a lot of responsibility. They have a lot of power and we have to, when we're, we're hiring them, we got to allow them to do their job. But we're not going to take everything they say at face value. Yeah, we're we not just going to take their word anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we have to have some accountability. We've had too many instances where we found out that police lied directly under oath or whatever the case may be. Which, by the way, if by chance, well, I, I think we can end it on this. But if by chance Mark and Kevin or a combination of one or the other, whatever they might be, end up being found, going to trial and found mm-hmm. guilty of this, mm-hmm. I don't see how. In a separate trial, you wouldn't put Bill Farrell on the stand. If that that has to happen first, mm-hmm. you wouldn't put him on the stand for obstruction of justice, perjury, amongst you know tampering with evidence, whatever it might be, a plethora of charges. I don't even know if he's still alive, but he's, prob- <laughs> he's probably a lot older now. I'm assuming, yeah. but um, it's something where in 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 the long term, if we find someone like this who potentially obstructed an entire case and and which led to the conviction of a, a wrong the wrongful conviction of another man we can't just have a lawsuit go forward where the city's taken on the responsibility of that criminal act, those criminal acts mm-hmm. we got to hold the individuals responsible as well especially if we can prove through other witnesses that information was relayed to them that was critical to the case and somehow didn't get to the people it should have been relayed to mm-hmm. so that's my that's my final take on this case a tragedy all the way around for Josh Keezer, for for Michelle Lawless. It's just a terrible case, but I think it was a great case to cover, and I'm glad we did. I, I'm glad we did, too, and I'm glad that a lot of people seem to not know about this case, and now they do, and that's important because it's like a, a hive mind. You know, you may not think you even know anybody connected to this case, but there's plenty of people from the area even who are like, oh, I'd never heard of this. So now maybe those people will start talking to other people, and maybe some of those other people will know something about Mark Abbott or about Michelle Lawless, and and they'll be able to contribute to all of the stacking circumstantial evidence that's coming out against Mark Abbott, maybe even Matt Abbott, Kevin Williams, and eventually, hopefully, the truth will come out. Well said. Guys, we appreciate you being here for Crime Weekly. If you haven't already, like the video, comment down below, let us know, subscribe to the channel. Uh, If you're listening on audio, please leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. You can actually leave a whole review on on, on Apple Podcasts. It helps the channel grow. It helps helps get these cases out to more people. Um, I think it's worth noting as we wrap up this episode, as I'm talking about ratings and reviews, um, that we just announced that we were not nominated for content creator of the year for podcast for clue awards, not something we expected. Um, there was a long list of podcasters that were on, in the running for that. We're in the top five right now. We don't know if we won, but, and I know it sounds corny or cliche, even if we don't win to think that we only started this channel two years ago yeah. and now we're preparing to go to this award ceremony with some really big podcasts, I think like Nancy Grace and there's a couple the of prosecutors. prosecutors are in there. Yeah. Are, they're in there. Um, Defense Diaries 
and a, a date with Dateline, I think is the final one. I hope I got crazy. all those right. Yeah. Um, it's crazy. And we, it does not go unnoticed. I know we thank you guys often, but this is the reason why. We would not be here without you. There's so much, there's so many podcasts now in this space to think that we have people who come religiously every single week to listen or watch us is incredibly humbling and it really does motivate us to do more. We talk about it all the time because we want to put our best foot forward for you guys and just understand that we truly are just getting started. We got some bigger plans in the future mm -hmm. and we couldn't do it without you guys. So, so thank you for that. Thank you guys so much. We really, I was like, I was like, damn, I don't think we're going to win because we are up against such like big players, but just the fact that we're included. Yeah, we're in the makes, conversation. Yeah. That makes but we me better win. Good. <laughs> <laughs> we no, better it's all, it's all voting. It's all voting. And it's like, it's all voting from the from the crime con people. So, I mean, there's a lot of people that are probably don't even know of us. So mm -hmm. we'll see what happens. It'll be a good night. And if we don't win, we'll just, you know, we'll steal the award from whoever does. Yeah. Nancy Grace. Give me Nancy, that. <laughs> you got enough awards, girl. Give it. Give this one to you us. You had enough rewards, Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> give, give us one. All right, guys. We appreciate it. We will be back with you soon. Everyone stay safe out there. Yes. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye.